Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of the friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Daniel. Daniel, how are you? I am very, very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. First of all, thanks for coming on the show to tell your story. I know it's not easy. This is a very deep and personal story. You've just released a book mm -hmm. talking about being gang raped, setting fire, involved in shootouts, mm -hmm. like a lot of stuff. And with you speaking out, a lot of people get inspiration from your story to then hopefully come forward and speak out about their own yeah. pain and misery. First and foremost, how are you? Yeah, good. It was just like, it's since the book's come out, it's been non-stop. There's been a lot of things to do, a lot of interviews. And yeah, it's been kind of different emotions. So yeah, I'm just excited, I guess, to see where it will go. Were you nervous about writing the book? Yeah, I was no nervous about writing it because, well, it was like two-sided because part of me, I'm like quite passionate about like women being hidden victims in gangs and things like that. So I did want to get my story out there to like promote that, that these things do happen but then on the other side you're exposing yourself to the world and exposing like the innermost thoughts of your life in a book and that's obviously really scary i always go back to the start of my guests where you grew up and how it all began i grew up in an estate in london um typical inner city london estate um it was like it was very back in them days it was like a very community feel the estates, everyone had their doors open. Summertime was great. Like we had a, no I had a normal childhood. We was just playing on the blocks, like shooting water guns at police, just being children and just having fun. And um, yeah, came from, I, I had parent, um, my mother is Cypriot, I'm Cypriot. And yeah, that's where it all started. Good life though. Yeah, like, as I said, like, my childhood was really, really nice, really good childhood. Um, all my friends was in the, like, we all lived together. We all lived down the road from each other on the same block. So I saw my friends every day. And yeah, it was just a normal, typical childhood, just going to school, coming back and playing out in the park. Who were you at school? I was, I was quite intelligent at school, but I was like almost a class clown a little bit. So in primary school, I was always just making jokes. I was a bit troublesome. But my grades were always really good. And I would say because we were all, I was kind of hanging around with the naughty kids at that time. So, yeah, we were all kind of causing trouble in school, but not anything major. And we were just jokers, like laughing and joking all the time. What about your dad? Um, yeah, so that was uh, my mum had a partner. So my dad, I don't know my dad. So, yeah. That How was much do you think that plays an effect on you as a kid? Um. I always wanted, I think I craved like having a, sh like a male around me for protection. So when I started like in my early teens, I always felt like I needed someone to protect me. I wasn't, I, I don't know what I was scared of, but I felt like I needed a man to protect me. So yeah, it may have been down to the fact that I didn't have like a male around me that I felt could keep me safe. What age did you start getting into trouble? Um, well, I, start, I started selling weed when I was, well, I had just turned 13. So I met a man when I was 12 and he was <clears throat> he was 19, but I had told him I was 15, but I was actually 12. And I like very visibly looked 12. Um, and he used to, like I used to leave school, sign into school, leave school, change my clothes, go and meet him and drive around in his car and we would sell weed and he would pay me. 
Um, and I remember like he gave me my first 50 pound note when I was 12 and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Cause I didn't, I'd never had no money. We didn't, I came from quite a poor background. So to have my first 50 pound note was amazing. And I remember like, I didn't even spend it. I literally just put it in my room and just kept it there. And I always used to take it out and look at it cause I'd never had that much money before. And I'd never seen a 50 pound note before. But I didn't get arrested until a few years after that. I think I was 14 when I first got arrested. When you were 12 though, you were having sexual intercourse with a man? Um, so basically he was wanted to wait until my 16th birthday, which would have actually been my 13th birthday. So at that time on my 13th birthday, he was really pressurizing me to have sex. I remember I was in his house and it was like, I don't know why I've got such a vivid memory of Jeremy Carl was on the TV. And um, he, I would say, forced me to have sex with him. I didn't want to do it. And I was telling him, no, get off me. But he carried on for not very long. It was only about maybe 40 seconds or something. Um, but after that, he would continuously pressurize me to have sex, which I didn't do. And luckily, a few months later, he went to prison. So I didn't actually have to deal with that for much longer. So that was a relief for me and I really felt disgusting afterwards I remember I went home and it was my literally my 13th birthday and my mum had made a cake and like it was all very innocent at home like all my presents was wrapped up and my mum was like oh let's go get a Chinese like as a special occasion um and I remember like sitting in the bath and crying and being like what the hell happened and yeah it was horrible like yeah it was not a nice experience at all I I did I don't think I didn't I don't class that as a rape for some reason though, which is really weird. Why do you think that is? I feel like, it, I don't know, like in my head, it was consensual even though it wasn't. And I think that might have just been programmed into me. I'm not too sure why I feel like that. Did your mum ever know what you were doing at that 12 and 13 out selling weed? No, so no one ever knew what I was doing. Um, I was still, I was like, trying to live two lives. So I was, at that time I'd gone to, I'd gotten into a grammar school and the grammar school was like very high performing grammar school, very high pressured environment to like achieve. And where I was coming from, um, my school was outside of my area. So I didn't have any friends in school. So it was hard to juggle, like still being from my estate, but then being with these girls in school and I was starting to get quite bullied at school. So my mum was aware of the bullying and she was aware that my grades were slipping, but she wasn't aware that I was skipping school like three or four days a week to go and sell weed with these gang members. So once your first boyfriend went to prison, what did you do after that? Um, so he went to prison and I started hanging around with his friends um, and they were still selling weed. They were quite heavily involved in armed robberies, but I didn't get involved with any of that and I actually stopped selling weed because I didn't want to do it for them so I wasn't doing it for a little while but whilst I was with them there was a lot of violence that I experienced so um the one time where I was told that I needed to tie a girl on a bench and set her on fire which was done um and everyone ran off and I remember like I couldn't I felt so guilty I had to ring the ambulance like I didn't really care if I got arrested or anything I just rang the ambulance anyway um like he cut off a boy's fingers in front of me there was a couple stabbings that I witnessed and this was all obviously at a very young age I was only about 14 or 15 so yeah it was becoming quite intense and hard to hide that life from what was going on at home as well how much does that play a massive part in your mind today that seeing people getting set on fire and stabbed and do you still um, think about it or do you try and block it out? I don't think about it at all. Um, I've been diagnosed with complex PTSD. And one of the symptoms is that is that you have no emotions. And like towards all of those things, I have no emotion. I can't, I feel nothing, which is like also quite scary that I feel nothing for these things. And like I can see, even as I was growing up, there was loads of violence that we that we witnessed. And it didn't. I didn't feel like it affected me at all, even though it probably did. So you stopped selling weed. See when you were that all that violence was happening, was mm -hmm. it was it a turn on as well because the, your father figure wasn't there? Did you look up to these people as men, and you just respected them in a way, even though you know it was fucked up? I did res I did respect them at a time, but I was more I was more fearful of them. Like I didn't like 
bear in mind, the, this gang was not from my area. They was another gang from another area. These were not my people. So like, even though I respected them, it was more out of fear than out of love. What would happen with the gang in your area? I found out you're going to be out with another gang. Would that have mattered? Being At a girl? that time, no, because I was so young and I wasn't involved with anything with the people from my area. They were hardly a gang themselves at that time either they were just young boys running around the streets so it wasn't that deep how that. many beatings did you have um from that particular era of my life none um as i got older and started like going country i was beaten up a few times but nothing like too major i then but all of this culminated in the fact that when i left this life i went and ended up being in a long-term relationship that was very violent so i don't know if that's got something to do with everything that i went through how old was he the partner that was quite violent yeah. to me um he was 35 how old were you um 25 yeah. was there a lot of violence in, was violence in every one of your relationships um no um the relationship with my baby's father was not violent and my relationship currently is not violent what was it like before you were pregnant what was your life like um by that time i was in care so um i didn't really have any like anyone to look out for me i was kind of advocating for myself and whilst i was in care i was just super wild like i didn't care about anyone i didn't care about myself um, I was getting arrested every other day for just stupid stuff. Um, and then having, getting pregnant calmed me down a lot. So like whilst I was pregnant, I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was just sitting at home, being a housewife and cleaning and cooking and yeah, expecting my child. What was it like going into care? Um, it was hard. I, wanted, I, w I was in and out of care my whole life um, because there was like issues with my mum. And so I was kind of used to it. I'd go into care for a little while, come back out, go into care. So going into care wasn't too much of a big issue for me. Um, and I preferred care at that time because I didn't have to put up a pretense at home. I could just be whoever I was at home. How much do you regret that as well with your mum putting her through all that shit? Yeah, I feel awful, obviously. Um, she dealt with a lot and it's not her fault. And now we have an amazing relationship. Like she's a, an amazing mum. And looking back now, I respect her so much for even putting up with everything I was putting her through and still just trying to be there for me as much as she could. What age was it when you were gang raped? Uh, 15. So still very young. Yeah. Well, yeah. How was that experience? <clears throat> how did that happen? Um, It happened that I was, I ended up in a flat with four men um and they tied me up they lit like poured alcohol like poured alcohol on me lit me beat me up they broke some ribs um and obviously all of four of them raped me um they videoed it as well it was like a horrific event but at the time i didn't really feel anything the only time i felt something or even showed emotion was one of the boys picked me up off the floor and took me into the bathroom and he sat me down like he had me across his lap like a baby and he started wiping my face for me like wiping my tears and like trying to push my hair back and stuff and he kept he was like I'm sorry like he was saying I'm sorry I didn't mean it to go this far and that like I broke I didn't even break down I just started crying because I almost felt a bit bad for him because I was like he really didn't want to do this he didn't he doesn't even want to be here he looked like almost he looked sick with what he had done. Um, anyway, eventually they let me out and I was on the street covered in blood with my knickers on and a coat. And I called the police, but unfortunately the boys were not prosecuted. Yeah, you can't feel sorry for him because he's still got choices at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. End of the day, he's a fucking rapist. That's true. You know what I mean? Like, you can't have emotion towards somebody who's trying to wipe your face because they had choices. He could have stopped it. He could have phoned the coppers. Yeah. He could have said no. So it's interesting because I had this conversation the other day and people were saying it might have been a case where he he was almost a victim as well. Even though we can't excuse rapists, it might have been that he was scared of the actual the person that was orchestrating all of this as well, to the point where he 
he went and done something that was so against his morals, but I'll never know. What about the coppers? How did, what, why did no one get charges? Um, so, well, initially I lied to the police and said I didn't know who it was because I was terrified. Um, and then one of these rape specialist officers came to me and she was like, look, I know you're lying. She was like, we know that you know who they are. So I gave her a full account, gave names, addresses, everything. And obviously for me, that was quite a big thing because although it's not, you're not a snitch to like say anything about rape, that's kind of how I felt inside. So I still felt quite bad doing it. Um, the boys got arrested and remanded, but when it went to the CPS, they were saying that I was an unreliable witness and all four boys had put in a statement to say that I was, um, they were using me as like a, a prostitute, like I was a known escort. And this is something I did. But what I don't understand is that surely if you're 15, it's statutory rape regardless. So I was a bit confused as to why it never went to court. But yeah, they were let out. Who was that for you? Um, I just felt let down and it just reinforced in my head that the police just are not going to help me. The police can't help me. Don't go to them for no help. They're not going to support you. And you really, you're on your own. And then at that point, that's when that whole thing of like, I need someone around me that needs that want that can protect me. That's what I was looking for at that time. Yeah, it's sad, man. Fifteen years old. That, yeah. To go through that torment and sort of pain, and it, to you even actually feeling sorry for one of the fucking guys mm -hmm. who abused you, just just shows you how much your emotions can be fucked up and tormented with. Where. Yeah. You don't know where the fuck you're coming or going. And no, it's, 100%. Yeah, sad for especially somebody so young. Like, so after those four, was there ever a threat that obviously you're anonymous today? We've got mm. um, pixelated your face so nobody can see you. But when you're going through that and they get out, was you ever a worry that they would come and try and kill you for sticking them in? Um, there was discussions in the flat on that day. So they let me out onto the balcony for like a period of time while they were discussing what they were going to do with me. But the window was open a little bit so I could hear. And they were saying, oh, we, we, we're just going to have to kill her because it's gone too far. We've tortured her. We've kidnapped her. And now we've raped her. We may as well just kill her. Like, there's no point. And then the, one of the boys was saying, no, 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 she's not going to snitch. She's not going to say anything. So, yeah, going back to that, I was constantly thinking like, oh, my God, they're going to kill me. And um, they were like a rival gang of my area. So there was always that threat of like, could this turn into something bigger? I wasn't really sure what, where it would go. Um, I definitely was scared. I actually saw one of the boys when I was nine months pregnant on the street. And I just like, I saw him and we looked at each other and we locked eyes and I just ran. I just started running. Like I dropped my bag and everything. I was out, I was on my way to college and I just started running up the road nine months pregnant. <laughs> It was really horrible. When they were in jail on remand, like, <clears throat> did people know what they'd done? Uh, yeah, so people knew. Um, and I was encouraging people to not do anything at that time. I was like, look, just let karma get them. Let the police deal with it. Because I really thought that they would just go jail. And my friends were saying, no, 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 like, we can't let this slide. Like, they're rapists. This is absolutely wild. We have to do something. Um, and then at the same time, I was getting like threatened by people from their area. So I was getting a lot of, in them times it was MSN. I was getting like MSN messages like, we're gonna kill you, we know where you live, etc., etc. How is it knowing that men can treat people like that? Like how damaging is that for them, for you to ever trust? Yeah, I've, I've been asked this question before. Like people were like, did you trust men after that? I did, if anything, I put too much trust in other men afterwards because I wanted, safety i wanted to feel protected so i almost went the other way and put too much trust into people how is that when you're looking for safety though but then that safety is destroyed where people are using your vulnerability to their own advantage mm -hmm. i don't know it didn't really like i, di I didn't see any of that at the time so <clears> i couldn't really i can't really talk on it because at the time all i wanted was someone bigger and badder than them to be around me and i didn't care what that person did to me I just didn't want that to happen again to me. What are you thinking then when you're in that house and they're saying that they're going to kill you? Are you, mm. f are you thinking, fuck it, or like, are you just willing to accept it, or did you try and escape? So I was outside at this point by myself. So mm. technically I could have just walked away or run away. I don't know what on earth was keeping me 
like stuck on that balcony, but I couldn't move. And I was looking at, I remember it so clear, like I was looking up at the sky and I started praying. I was like, please God, like, please just let me live. Let me just survive this and I'll, I'll be good. Like I promised, like I almost felt like it was some karma for what I had done. And I was just praying, praying, praying. And then that's when they let me back in the house and were like, oh, we're all going to get, um, we're going to book a cab for you to go back to your own area. Was the taxi driver not suspicious? Probably. No. I've no idea. Like, I've literally got no idea at all. Was there no DNA, nothing that could have tried and convicted them? Or was it too late? There was there was DNA. Bec well, I went to, like, one of those sexual health places that the police send you to and they did all the swabs and in my mouth and all the DNA. And there was, like... um there was a video of it. They had took they had taken a video of it with like them throwing up their own gang signs, asking me to throw up their gang signs. So I don't understand. Like I still to this day don't understand how they didn't get convicted for that. Where did you get the strength to stack them in? Um, I think it was police pressure. To be honest, they were just on me. Like I, I kept having interviews, and at this time I was doing like my mock GCSEs. There was so much other things going on. Um, and the police were just, she, she kept saying to me, we know, you know, we know, you know, you may as well just tell us because we know, you know. So I was just like, I was just tired. And I just said, okay, cool. I'm going to tell you thinking they will protect me. Obviously not. <laughs> How does that make you feel towards the system? Um, I just felt really hurt. I, like I said, I just felt mistrustful of the police anyway. So that just added extra mistrust into my brain about the police. I no longer respected them. I no longer respected what they do did for a job. Um, and I didn't know at that time I was I was too young. I didn't really understand that it was the CPS that does the convictions and not the police. So now looking back, it's almost like the CPS need to change their procedures, not necessarily the police, even though the police have work to do as well. But the CPS, the threshold is too high for rape, rape cases. <clears throat> like not enough rape cases get charged to this day. So after that experience, did your life spiral or did you think, st still such a young kid, still got a lot of grown up to do, were you thinking, I'm going to try and get away from this life or uh, did it just get worse from there? Um, no, it didn't actually get worse from there. I mean, at, well, it did, but not at that point. So at that point, I met my son's father and he was like a good man at the time. He didn't treat me any type of way. Um, I moved in with him. And obviously got pregnant super quick and he was just taking care of me, like making me eat. Like he was like, oh, you need to eat a lot of iron and just making sure I was all right and running me baths. And like, this was a new experience for me. Like a man had never treated me like this before. So this was great. Like I was happy and I was happy that I was having a baby. And I thought that this was going to be <clears throat> the end of my, like, this would be it. I'm going to be married to this man and that's it. And obviously that's not how it went. Um, I had my child and everything was perfect. Like I love being a mom. I'm still super maternal today. Like that's, I love kids. And I was just so happy with my new son. I was just besotted with him. And, but at that stage, the, my relationship was with him was going downhill because he was also so young. So um, I got account, I got given my council flat and that's when it started to go a bit left. Selling drugs? Um, not straight away, no. Um, at first, I was just getting money, renting out my kitchen. So, like, people, boy, a boy that I knew asked to rent out my kitchen for 300 or 400 pound a time. And he would come, he would send me Westfield. He'd be like, go Westfield with your son, you know, go do whatever you want to do. I used to come home, my flat was spotless. Was like, okay, cool. I knew something illegal was going on in the kitchen, but I didn't know that he was cooking crack in there until maybe a few months after that. Yeah, but is that, is, what age were you then? Still 17, 18? <clears throat> I was 18 then, yeah. Yeah, so still a kid. How old are these people still? <laughs> they was, t that particular boy was 22, I believe. Yeah, still kids. You're just thinking, that age, you just want an earner, try and yeah. provide for your kid, not realising the destruction it causes. Even mm -hmm. the kid in there couldn't crack that. Like, looking at it, it's fucking wrong, but mm -hmm. again, at that age, he's probably thinking he's giving you an earner and, and helping you along the way. Yeah. I literally like looking back now I'm horrified that I let that happen with my child in the house but as you said I was so naive and I didn't realize he was cooking crack literally until afterwards and when I found out 
I was, we had an argument about it, but he was like, look, at the end of the day, you're getting this much money for a couple hours of me using your kitchen. You may as well just let me use it. So I was like, okay, fine. And by that stage, I'd given out, I'd made five copies of my keys and they'd gone out to like five people from my estate. And that was that after that. How did, when did it go pear-shaped? Um, I was starting to be in a relationship with a man from my area um, who was a little bit older than me. And he was just on the streets. Like he was just doing whatever he was doing. And one day he was like, oh, I'm going to go do a robbery. Like, you know, I know someone that's got some some drugs. Like we're going to go rob them. So I was like, okay, cool. I'll see you when you get back. And he went and done that. Anyway, nothing really happened. He was like, yeah, everything went really well. Like we got what we wanted. And I think it was a few days after that, we were all in my house and people were chilling in the kitchen. And um, some like masked men came in my house and started shooting up the place, shot up my flat with everyone in there. And obviously me and my son in there as well. What are you thinking then? Like you've been through fucking gang rapes, people trying to set you in fire, like in and out of homes to then having your son, your pride and joy, like your baby in it, and to then people fucking having shootouts in your house, like, is that just normal? Or did they actually think, right, there's something not right here in my life? No, that wasn't like, that just was the beginning of the end. Like that, that moment just ruined everything for me. So obviously after that, I lost my son, lost custody of my son over that, of course. Um, whilst it was going on, I just... I took my, we was lying on bed watching our, um, the iPad, we was watching Pingu. And I, when the shooting started, I just put him under my bed and I was like, let's play hide and seek. Let's go under the bed. And I was just covering his ears and just waiting for it to become quiet. And he didn't even cry. Like, I don't know if he was just in shock himself. He did, he couldn't process it. He was such a young baby. He didn't cry or anything. And then I waited until it was quiet, but I waited for like a long time after it was quiet. And then I came out and yeah, it was just bullet holes was just riddled all over my house. And I was like, oh my God. And for some reason I started cleaning. I started cleaning, like manically cleaning because obviously they'd been in my kitchen making, cooking drugs. So, and I knew the police was going to be on their way. So I started cleaning my kitchen, like bleaching everything. Cause I was like, the worst situation could occur now is that Obviously, they're going to take my son, plus I get arrested for some sort of drug dealing. Like, that's not what I wanted. Um, and, of course, gun police came and I got arrested. And, yeah, they put my son in care. And who was that for you? The most horrific thing that's ever happened to me in my life. So, like, even everything that I've done, everything that I've seen, nothing compares to losing my son. Like, he is... an he's everything I've only I've only ever cared about him I've only ever loved him so horrific horrific did anybody get shot no um everything no they were fine everyone got out they jumped out the window fucking hell man that, <clears throat> yeah that's an experience like how old is your son now um he is 11 did you ever get him back no and is that still playing your heart every day so I'm currently um like going to court I've been going to court for quite a few years now to get custody back of him but um it's proving a little bit challenging and it's like that's one thing I just can't get over it just hurts me so like in my heart like I don't try I don't think about it because if I do think about it I just break I'll cry like I'll break down it's 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 too much for me to handle do you understand though why it happened of course 100 percent. and like I take full responsibility for what happened and you know I hope one day when I can explain to my son what happened and how it happened um he he may have some level of understanding or hope he has some level of understanding around that situation have you ever had any communication with him um a little bit of communication via letters but that's it yeah that's fucking sad like mm -hmm. it's a uh... It's like every woman, like parents' worst nightmare is to lose their kids, especially if, listen, parents lose kids all the time. Some become addicts, some pass away in, in circumstances. But when you're still here and still young, and that's the end of the day, you are groomed. You've been groomed for fucking many, many years where people have used you, abused you, and put you to the side where you thought it was normal. In the kitchen, people cooking up crack, people shooting guns, like, part of that would have been fucking normal. Like, mm. And it's 
only till you realise and get older you realise how fucking messed up that you were that every majority of people are that there's yeah. not many people see the world differently some people just go well I just accept it that my son's been took away but hopefully one day you can sort that out what's the sort of challenges that are placed in front of you because of your previous no that's not even a challenge at all it's actually just more the fact that um it's been many many years since my son has seen me and um i can't be sure that he even remembers who i am and that's obviously heartbreaking for a mum but he's safe he's sound and he's, he's a good 100%, life yeah he's a hundred percent safe he's a hundred percent living a great life and yeah i just yeah he's happy yeah. And you've never had any more kids? No, no. Is that one of the reasons why? For a long time, there was just no suitable man. <laughs> I just didn't want to have a baby with any of these men. I've had that relationship with that man in <clears throat> that gang or whatever you want to call it for quite a long period of time. And then after that, I went straight into a relationship with that very violent partner that I was telling you about. And that neither of those situations were right to bring a child into. And this was after you lost your son? Yeah. When did you get beaten with 20 people? Pardon? Did you get beat up with 20 people and set in fire? When was that? No, so that was when I'd, I'd done that to someone. Mm -hmm. So that was before the shooting, before, that was even before the rape. So I was about 14 when that happened. And they just viciously beat up this girl and told me and another girl, if we don't tie her down and set her on fire, then we're going to get beaten up. That's the one at the park bench? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's fucked up, man. Like, yeah. Have you ever seen anybody about like PTSD? And obviously, you have if you've been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But have you ever seen like counselors yeah. or therapists to? So from about fifteen, yeah. So after the uh, rape situation, I was referred obviously to CAMS, and was in CAMS till I was eighteen. Um, it didn't do anything for me. The counselor literally said, um, "You're going to be incapable of loving anyone." Uh, you're very, you're just an angry teenager. They diagnosed me with ADHD, which I don't have. Um, so that was just, yeah, that was not, it didn't go how it was meant to go basically. And then oh, after that in my like later life, I didn't have time to do all of that because there was so much going on. Um, and then about a year ago, I referred myself back to like psychotherapy team or whatever. And then that's when I got diagnosed with complex PTSD. What about drinking drugs? Never. I don't, I've, I've only recently started having like a one drink, but I'm one of those people, I'll drink like half, half a cup of Corvossier and Coke and I'll be drunk, like tipsy, because I've never drink, drunk anything in my life and I've never taken any drugs. Why was that? I've seen the effects in front of my face and I just, I never wanted to be that person. And the thing with the drinking, I have like a very big phobia of, being sick and also I don't like feeling out of control so the feet that whole concept of being drunk and not knowing who I'm with and who's around me and not knowing how I'm getting home I don't want to do any of that I want to know everything and I want to be safe and sober so it's like only now in my adult life I feel comfortable I feel trust like I trust the people around me that I've started like having not drinking but like when I go out I might have a one drink now so after you lost your son like, and you, you, then you're in a, an abusive relationship? Um, so, so, so after I lost my son, I was, I, start, I was already in a relationship with the man that I eventually went on to go to sell drugs with in the countryside. County lines? Yeah, county lines, the country. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't violent. Um, there was a few occasions where like there was physical altercations or... Like, I remember one time he locked me in the house to stop me going carnival. But other than that, there was nothing really that serious. That is serious though. Yeah, I know. I downplay it all the time and it's not good. Like, we need to empower people that this is not normal. But where you've been through these things for so long and that relationship is so controlling, it does become normalised to you. Why do you think you did accept that? I was just... I was just looking for love. Like, I just felt... Like I was just empty, like I'd lost my son. I didn't have anything. I felt like I didn't have anything. And this man at the time was providing, paying for my flat, paying, buying me cars, paid for my driving lessons, was giving me money, was 
given me some sort of, like we had a relationship, like we'd go on dates, he'd take me out, he'd take me to the spa, he'll take me all these places. So I felt like this is okay. Like this is okay for me. I can put up with the other stuff. Would you, is, have, would you have killed for a man if he told you to? No, but I would have gone in prison for a man at that time. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, so stupid. Like. That, like, because you're not, it's not as if you're naive, you're not. But when you're being groomed like, and you're just looking for that father figure and want somebody mm. to love you, then you're willing to accept any bullshit that they say to you. Yeah. Sit in the room, you're not going to the carnivore. Stay in there, don't come out. I'll, I'll, you'll get food when I say that. That's mass manipulation mm -hmm. to the fucking extreme. Mm -hmm. That's mental torture, not just physical. Like. And as a star young kid, like, it's scary to think that how sour it can go mm. and how bad that people can actually just accept that life like i say it's not just showing it it works both ways male and female that yeah um there's plenty of good men out there and there's plenty of good women out there and there's, there's plenty of fuckers out there as well where you just couldn't go near them with a bad yeah. pole, that. but when did you start waking up to it, realizing that my life's a fucking mess here that there was a certain point in your life when you, you had some realization um i don't know it's so hard to tell Obviously, I left my area when I was 23 or 24. I can't remember. Um, Why did you leave there? I got arrested for the millionth time and in country. And um, the, ju the judge just basically said, look, this is your last chance. Like, I'm going to give you a community sentence, but this is your last chance. And I just said to myself, do you know what? I can't, you can't do this no more. You can't do this. For, you, you cannot do this forever. Now is your only opportunity to make a difference. And I had a really good probation officer as well. Like she was a big inspiration to me. Like she showed me that this is not normal and there's a different life out there. You don't have to, although you're, you feel like you're good at selling drugs, there's, this is not what you should be doing. And I left and eventually, yeah, I went to uni and started my new life, I guess you would say. So when you were doing the county lines, what were you selling, Smack? Um, crack and heroin, yeah. And how much money were you making a day? Uh, the line was about three thousand three hundred pound a day average. But how much were you getting from that? Um, so at first I would get hundred quid. No, I was getting a thousand pound a week. Um, that was before I started buying into the box myself, and then obviously all the profits were mine. Were you cutting it up yourself? Yeah. How many phones did you have? Well, just one. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it, to think? What were you doing with your, your money? Were you, were you just enjoying <laughs> life? It. Yeah. Spending on shape? Yeah, fast money comes and that's fast money goes. That's literally it. Like, we was just doing up Harrods and Mayfair and restaurants and spas and just ridiculous stuff and designer handbags and things. And I came I came away with it with a, a small amount of savings, but not much. Yeah. It's crazy to think, listen, I used to sell gear on that bike in the mm. day and you don't give a fuck about human beings. When you actually no. see somebody's mother or father or son or daughter coming to you for drugs, only thing you can think about, they're going to get me a Gucci belt. They're yeah. going to get me a Rolex. They're going to get me... You don't yeah. give a fuck about killing a soul, man. And that's... No. When I started getting older and started making changes, like, my conscience came to the forefront. And I thought, wow, mm. how much has come back can you be, like, to do that? Like, to be using people for materialistic shit that doesn't really mean fuck all that like, yeah. that's the hard thing for me anyway when i was trying to make changes but when you go through that period and you see people buying gear and that you've not got you don't give a fuck about them it was like the pregnant women that used to come and be like please like can i have two on two and we it just makes you cringe because it's just like oh god like you know and you'll try to say to them no come on you're pregnant like let's not do this and they will be on the floor begging you and it's just like this is not normal like yeah, we did used to treat them like animals. It was hor horrible, like horrible the way. But the whole like motto was that if we don't sell it to them, someone else will. That was like always drummed into my head and you're just made to feel like it's normal. But it's true. It's just for materialistic stuff that don't even mean nothing. And you're probably either going to lose or give to someone or whatever anyway. So how many times do you think you got to jail? Did I what? How many times do you think you got the jail? What good? What do you mean, like, go to... Well, no, how many times did you get jailed? Oh, never. No, before... I know you never get sent away, but oh. how many charges all in do you think oh. you've had? Um, there's been a few, like, close calls. I think really the only time that it would have potentially happened was when I was arrested for um, conspiracy. Because... To supply? I was, 
yeah, conspiracy, conspiracy with intent to supply class A. But that's just because I was, that's what we were doing. So I was just quite concerned that the evidence would mount up and they would be able to charge us with that. But they, they didn't manage to. Why do you think you were never sent to prison? Maybe white privilege, to be honest with you. It might have been that because every time I stood up in court, it was me and then one, two or three black males. And for some reason, they were always seeing me as the victim in this situation. And I was getting community orders and them lot was getting custodial sentences. I don't know what it was because I was doing the same thing as them. How hard is it you see when you start making changes to gradually f try and move on from the past because you've been involved in some mad shit like mm -hmm. you've been a victim but you've also created victims yeah. as well that like, that's a hard thing like you say that as well you, you have been a victim but you've also done wrong as well but you can accept it because of everything you went through where you think fuck me like, because it turns us into animals mm -hmm. evil like because of what we go through it's not that we're I believe everybody's got goodness in them in some degree obviously some people might disagree with that, but some people get turned into these characters that they eventually become. Like, how hard is that for you as you're getting older and realising that it's an absolute fucked up mess? Like, is that, do you understand and take responsibility for the things you were involved in as well? Yeah, 100%. And like, I made it very clear in my book that I take responsibility for everything. This was my doing. And yeah, of course, I, I knew what I was doing at the time. I'm not stupid. I wasn't, you know, drunk, I wasn't drugged to do these things. I was in my right mind. However, I think in hindsight, I can see, and especially when I wrote the book and it's on paper, I can see all the red flags leading up to what then happened. So, and to be honest, the, the breaking point for me was losing my son because I literally had nothing to live for. I just didn't care about anything anymore. I didn't care about myself. I just did not care. And that led me to do things that I would never normally do. But at the same time, I've always, like, I hold myself in quite high regard that I'm I'm a kind person. I've got a good heart. And I do regret the things that have led to, you know, people suffering. Were you ever suicidal? Never. No. But that's a good thing, though. Yeah. To not want to quit and give up and just enough's enough. Yeah. Because part of you probably had your son in the back of your mind. You've always wanted to fight for him. It could have been that, yeah. No one's ever said that to me before. Maybe it is that. But no, I've never wanted to... No, I've always just known I've got like a bigger purpose here and I need to, as you said, get my son back. And when did you go to uni? Um, I went to uni in 2017, so not that long ago. So when did you really start making the changes on your own life to get away from the madness? What age were you? 2016, I was, a, but I can't remember if I was 23 or 24, um, but I moved areas like completely like across the other side of London um, and started to try and make a change however the that world is a small world and obviously when I got to my other area I've reached out to people in that area that I know um because I didn't know the area I wanted someone to show me around let me know what's going on who to talk to who not to talk to who to avoid and the boy was basically like he knew me anyway and he was like listen I'm gonna give you a car I'm gonna buy you a car and, like run my phone make yourself some money so I was like okay cool and it's like, literally, it was just that easy. Like, every even when I was doing all of these things, people were like DMing me saying, oh, come and work for me instead. I'll offer you more money than what so-and-so is paying you. Um, but then shortly after that, literally like a week after that, and I started doing that in my new area, um, I met this man and he basically said to me, if you continue selling drugs for these people, I will never chat to you. Like, me and you can't be anything. Um... And he said, he made me give the people back their car and their phone line. And then that was that. I was just with him after that. How long you were with him? I was with him for about uh, four or five years. It was a whole shit show with him as well. Even though you stopped doing the bad stuff, like, what yeah. was happening in that relationship? He was a drug dealer himself anyway. Um, so more controlling, basically? Yeah, so at first um, it was like, I don't know, I think they call, they've got like a word for it. I think it's called like love bombing or something. Like literally like he was taking me out every single week, doing a like telling me to move in with him, buying me stuff, like, and I was thinking, oh, okay, nice, cool, whatever. Um, he asked me to be his girlfriend and we moved in together. And then that's when it just started slowly, slowly creeping in that it got to the point where he'd have cameras in the house, chuckers on my car, 
recording devices in my car. Um, and obviously he was beating me up as well. What? Yeah. That's yeah. a fucking lunatic. So I went from like one... Extreme to another? Yeah. Because I wasn't selling any drugs with him. I was just... But then what happens? And then as you're being totally controlled, where you become dependent on these people. Yeah. No money, no nothing. You need them. Yeah. Break and you that's down, actually what it was. Slowly, gradually, mm -hmm. fucking break your soul. That Just typical like DV oh. relationship. Literally, that's exactly what it was. So how did you get away from that one? I just left. I'd had enough. It, after that many years of going through all of these things, I, I couldn't take it no more. And by this point, I don't know how I got there. I don't know if it was my friends or I don't know what happened, but I managed to get the strength to say, no, you deserve better than this. Like this is not for, this life is not for you. You are meant to do better things than this. You're a better person than this. You, you deserve to be treated right. And I left. Did they ever come after you? Uh, for a while, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, typical like controlling man. He couldn't get, couldn't let me go, um, but he's let go now. Everything takes time. What? Yeah. So what happens after that then? When you try to get away from another abusive relationship, where every man that comes into your life kind of just fucking torments you. <laughs> so what do you do then? What's your steps? You have to just you just have to trust your instincts and hope that this time you're going to be right. That this person is going to treat you right and just have hope that humanity is good and not all men are going to be like that. There's some men out here that were raised right and know how to treat a woman right as well. Yeah, it's difficult though because we do put, I believe like attracts like as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. where you're attracting that energy because it's, like any drug dealer, it's a low vibrational being. It's not that they're bad people, it's what they're conditioned to do. Yeah. And, and the product of your environment as well where it seems fucking normal. Mm -hmm. Living in a life of chaos is normal. So when I started making changes, when you're in peace you think there's something not right what the fuck is wrong here so you cause a back yeah. yours just to fucking feel normal again but i just feel like that i mean there is no narrative of this but like drug dealers are not bad people but women beaters are do you know what i mean so even though he was a drug dealer that side of me wasn't concerned about that you can make your money however you want to make your money at the end of the day as long as i'm not involved but to be physical towards a woman is just it's just not right. Like, there's no excuse in it, is there really? There's no excuse in many behaviours, but mm. we're, we're living in a society now where we're accepting a lot. Yeah. And that's for anybody watching or listening. You don't need to accept fuck all. Mm -hmm. You own nobody, nothing in this life. We only get one shot at it. Yeah. But if you're not, if you're in a relationship full of pain, if you're in a job you hate, uh, dig deep, man. Make the changes, make the sacrifices, and, and spread your wings and try and make a better life for yourself. And that's for anybody that's in a building site. Uh, yeah. And I think at the end of the day, that saying is so true. Like, if you don't love yourself, no one's going to be able to love you. Like, you really have to love yourself and know your worth before yeah. a man or a partner is going to know your worth. But it's difficult because we all struggle with that, I think. We yeah. live in a world where we don't really love ourselves enough. We can all speak, speak, speak about it and preach it, but it's difficult because mm -hmm. we're constantly competing against other people, especially on social media. And that's what I was saying earlier, that people can make changes, whether you're on a building site, taxi driver, lorry driver, Whatever it is, you can mm. want more in life. If you're happy with that life, then so be it good on you. But you can always want more. You can always run your own business. You can always call your own shots and take things to where you want to take it. Yeah. So how did your book come about? Was it Top Girl? Yeah, so it's called Top Girl. Um, I didn't actually choose that name. But the, Who chose um, the name? So I had a ghostwriter help me with this book. And he um, he chose the name because kind of as a spin-off of like Top Boy, which is like everyone's... Everyone really enjoys that series. It's a great series. Um, and it came about because I did a radio interview about County Lyons drug dealing with BBC. And he reached out to me and had heard me on the radio. And he was like, look, like I think your story's amazing. It's inspiring. And I'd like to help you write your book. So I was like, amazing. And we got to work. COVID hit. And... Um, we took it as a good sort of opportunity to not do any other work and just focus on the book. Um, we did hours of interviews, like hours and hours and hours of interviews. And he was very considerate, like, you know, make sure you're not re-traumatizing yourself. And we got it done. And he, yeah, it's a big achievement. Like, I feel really proud. It's not every day you write a book. Yeah, you should. How much was, how hard was it though to trust somebody saying, look, we can write a book, this and that. You're not thinking another fucking chancer or... Did you just, did it feel right? To be honest, at first, I think everyone around me was quite concerned. Everyone was like, 
what is what are his intentions out of this what does everyone want like are you just going to sell yourself for an amount of money and um for me it was more than that like I just wanted to because I think if you if you read the book it's it's got some horrible stories in there but at the end it's it's I am trying to inspire people and empower people that you don't need to live like this so that was more my motivation for saying do you know what trust this man tell him your story and hopefully it can help someone in the how future. was it writing the book how was it going over the experiences does that make you realize how fucked up your life was or did you already know that anyway i already knew and also like i said this complex ptsd i don't feel anything for these events they literally feel like nothing so and i i don't mean that that sounds like it comes across wrong but it's not mean it's not meant like that if you know what i mean it's like it's like I've my brain has detached itself from from these events. That's why I can go over them and not really feel too much pain. Um, but the only part, obviously, that did hurt was um, at the back of the book, the the last chapter. I've written a letter to my son, and that was very hard for me. But you see, you're detached, but there's still been a lot of emotion in your face as well, talking about certain things. That is that just to kind of block out the pain? Have you just become so numb to life and immune to? You never come immune to fucking pain, but mm. you know what I mean? Like, where you try and block it out so much that you don't want to feel it because you know how painful it is? Or do you think one day it's just, just gonna, you're just going to open the gates and <laughs> it's just going to non-stop? Yeah, no, I'm, I don't know because I've never let that happen. I've always just kept it inside. And the times I have thought about my son, I, it's, I'm just going to be inconsolable and I, I don't want to be weak. I don't, I've got things to do. I've got, things to fight for and things to live for and I can't live my life you know being upset and depressed like I want to be happy I, I've spent a long time being very sad did you ever think you would write a book never in my life like when everyone was texting me like oh my god you're going to be an author this year and I was it was just mind blowing to me that that is what I can now say I am and I'm super super proud like and I just want some per one person to just read it and understand a little bit more than they did yesterday about other people's lives. Is your mum still alive? Yeah. Did she know half the shit that went on? Mm, no. <laughs> no. Did you have to give people a heads up? No, I've asked everyone that is around me, anyone I care about, I'd, I would, I'd prefer it if they didn't read the book. Um, Why is that? Just because I want to protect people from being hurt anymore. Because I think my family and my friends are proud of me and I don't want to taint their mind of me. Like I don't want them to think I'm a horrible person. So I've asked them to not read the book. If they don't, if they do, I'm never going to, I don't think I'm going to know anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I hope they kind of take that into account. How hard is that? Because I've met your boyfriend, seems like a nice guy. He's a nice guy. Like, I genuinely am happy. And I just feel like I've just got this sense of, like, I can't put it into words. I just feel so free now. Like, I just don't feel any sadness. I don't feel any pain. Like, I wake up in the morning and I'm happy. And, yeah, I don't want to cry. So let me just not. <laughs> yeah, but that's a good feeling. Yeah. Because we'll fuck up, we'll make mistakes. Yeah. Look at the torment you've been through. You were grown for a young age, fuck's sake. You were mm. used and abused. That like, to come out on the other end of it and then write a book, then it becomes inspiration for other people. Mm -hmm. You're not a bad person because you sell gear. Yes, it's a bad thing. You destroy lives, but you've got to come to the conclusion that what you're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. And as long as you can do that, then you can grow from it. We ain't who we were in the past. Yeah. So we can't be there. Like, we fuck up, we make mistakes. It's life, man. It's Everybody does it, mm -hmm. but we can't live there. I'm different from who I was last week, yesterday, 10 years yeah. ago. And I'm fucking glad because I didn't like who the fuck I was. The shit that I'd done and I was involved mm. in. I, I, it still hurts your heart to this yeah. day, but you can't really live there because it would consume you. Life goes on. Mm -hmm. We make mistakes. I've seen the the biggest and baddest men make the, the most amazing transitions in life to become great individuals. Yeah. And I've seen people who had it all together and became absolutely fucking devils. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's around the corner. Yeah. Split instincts and split seconds. People's life can change for the better or worse. Yeah. Like, how is that then going through your life and going through your book and how is it going through a relationship and talking about that as well? That 
listen, somebody's got to accept you for who you are, what you've done, the good and the bad, yeah. to truly love you, and then that's when you go, okay, I feel safe here. But do you think part of you not wanting them to read their book that they'll judge you to a degree, and then that happiness that you've got will maybe get took away? Um. Yeah. Parts. Yeah. That's partly true, and just it's just. I know it sounds so weird because I've now put it in a book for everyone to read, but this is my my personal life laid out in small, small details. And I just feel like some there's some people in your life that you just want to keep some things private from because you don't, like I said earlier, like I don't want anyone to be tainted and I don't want anyone to look at me sideways or not feel like they can trust me. What did your mum say? My mum said she wouldn't read the book and I don't think she will. Um, she made a joke. She was like, oh, let's, I'm going to, maybe you can read it to me on my deathbed. <laughs> I was like, that, <laughs> that will, would push it over, the, push fucking over the edge. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I said back. I said, bloody hell, that might be the last straw. Um, but yeah, let's see. I don't know. She's, she's very proud of me now and I'm very lucky to have her. Would part of you want your son reading your book in a few years? No, and that's like part of the reason even though I put the letter in there that's more for like people to feel like a mother's pain um I wouldn't really want my son reading it and that's partly the reason why I chose to like do this anonymously and like write my book under a different name and stuff because um although I am going to tell him I want it to be when he's ready and not because he's seen it in a bookshop and picked it up and been like that's my mum so I want to do that in like a private setting what about going forward for the future for your son? Like, what's the steps then to try and get him back? Is it your son's choice? Is it the the social worker's choice? Like, yeah. Court's choice? How, how does it work? Um, there's no social workers involved, um, which is great. Um, and it's more that my son doesn't really remember me being his mum. So, and he's got a life, you know, with his family. And he refers to someone else's mum now. And I don't want to disrupt that too soon. I want this to all be on his terms and at his pace, which is why currently it's just letter writing back and forth and like some pictures here and there. And I get to send him presents and like Christmas presents and birthday cards and things like that. And I'm hoping that we can progress this further to like maybe telephone or seeing him in person at some stage, hopefully soon. How do you think you'll be when you get to hear your son's voice? I, I can't even, I don't even know what his voice sounds like anymore. I don't know how big his hands are. I don't know how tall he is. So in my head, I still see him as that little baby. And like, sometimes like I can feel his little hand in my hand. And that's how I remember him, like a tiny little hand and his hand's not tiny anymore. So I don't know how I'm going to feel. It's going to be very emotional. Yeah, it's such a difficult one because obviously your life was a fucking, it was a mess, mm -hmm. let's be honest, but the, whoever took your son in has done it to, for protection. If they're hearing stories as gunshots, your, your son could have got one in the head, man. Of course. You imagine what your life would have been like for, you know, you're in prison for murder and your own son, basically. Yeah. Because you don't know who's going to force you to take blame or whatever you, in these circumstances. Everybody's no, ruthless. Course. Everybody looks out for themselves. So what they do is try and blame the girl mm -hmm. whose house it's in because everything comes on top for you. No matter who's cooking the gear in there, it's still your yeah. house so you get the blame. So for the parents as well, it must be hard, but at least you're getting to send Christmas presents and stuff. Like, have you ever spoke to the people who's raised your son? Um, yeah, he's with family. Um, so I know he's been well looked after and, you know, I've said to them, like, I appreciate you stepping up and taking care of your ch our child. Our child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You will get to see him one day. And at yeah. that age now, 11, where they will be asking questions, like 13, yeah. 14, that like, it doesn't matter who, how far the, the bond has been broke. Like, the bond is always still going to be there with a mother and son. It's the strongest bond on this planet, I yeah. believe. Like, my mum is an absolute fucking psychopath, but I love her to bits. Mm -hmm. And everything I do is for my family. Like everything I do now, I was selfish for many years. I made a lot of money, but I had bad addictions, mm -hmm. gambling and a fake party life where nobody got fuck all. Now everything I do is for the family. Everything I do yeah. is to make, when I succeed, they succeed. Yeah. And that's why I keep going. That's why I keep raising the bar. And you can never give up hope. No matter what you're doing in life, no matter how fucked up you are. If you're lying in a prison cell, people come out, change their life and, mm. and become inspirational. 
you're becoming an inspiration from selling gear, from mm. everything you've been through, the torment, the pain, living in fucking hell. You yeah. accepted it for too long and you're a prime example. You don't need to accept it no more. Yeah, no, 100%. And that's what my motivation is for, for my family and for the people I love. What's it like feeling happy? <laughs> just free. I just feel like just light and just like just every day like nothing bothers me like nothing can bother me anymore I'm just happy like anything that comes at me now it's just like I'm it's not really going to affect me because I'm I'm happy now how do you move on to everything you've been through is there a big part of forgiveness in that from the people who abused you um no it, I just need to forgive myself I don't give any energy to those people I don't give any energy to anyone that was in my past I just give energy to myself now and I just trust, I, like I've trust that people are good people still. I still like maintain that to this day. There are good people out here. Did you ever think you would get to that stage? Having good people around you, being happy, waking up thinking like, fuck me, man, that life's... Pretty life's good. Okay, <laughs> yeah. um, no, there was times when I didn't think that. Um, and there's been times when you know, back then when I'd lie in bed and think, no, I will be happy and I will get married and I have my family and kids and live in a nice house. That's always what I've wanted and hopefully I can get that. How has it been talking about this experience? Harder than I thought. <laughs> um, I never <laughs> think, <laughs> I never think I'm going to get emotional, but I was very close and that's like super weird for me. So, yeah. Yeah, because this goes out a big audience as well. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it can be nerve wracking, but it's still your story. Mm -hmm. We're also here to promote a book as well. And for people, listen, plenty of people are abused and too scared to come forward. Like, for anybody that's watching that's maybe been through a bit of a fucked up life, like, and they don't see maybe a, a way out, what advice would you have for them? Don't, if you, they don't see a way out, um, <clears throat> there's always a way out. There's always, you, you can always forgive yourself. Like, you. And I think I said it earlier, just we have to learn to love ourselves. Like really focus on that and don't worry about anyone else. Where do you go for the future? Onwards and upwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, just try and like I do a job that I love. Um, I've got good people around me um, and continue fighting for my son. And I don't know where the future is going to take me, but I just know it's going to be good. <laughs> That's all you can do. Yeah. Man, what, what, what about your book potential getting turned into a series or a film? Or where do you go with that? I would love that. Like that's such a huge opportunity, obviously. Um, and if it comes, it comes. And I'm just riding the wave at the moment. I don't. I didn't know what would happen with this book. I didn't know if I'd sell only one copy and no one would care. Um, so I'm just seeing what would happen and just going with the flow really where can people buy your book they could buy it in any major bookstore um, they can buy it on Amazon um, yeah would you like to finish up on anything no thank you very very much it's been great and thank you for having me that's indeed I wish you all the best oh, for the future thank you good luck with the book good luck with everything and I hopefully one day you get to see your son thank you God bless